Yeah, I'm going to quickly talk about, uh, I guess, circuit board design from a hobbyist perspective. Uh, since we only have 30 minutes, let's get right to it. Yeah, my name is Sebastian Roll, and I run a small consulting company in Norway. Uh, but on the side, I do a little bit of hardware design together with my friends. Uh, it's nothing special, but um, we like to create uh, small things that we can use in conjunction with Python workshops. Um, so we teach people MicroPython by having them something tangible that they can work with during the workshops. So I hope to share uh, a little bit about my experiences. I would call myself an yeah, entry-level hardware designer. But hopefully there's something together uh, in terms of information. The agenda will be that we'll be looking at um, how to get the components that you want, how to figure out which components you want and how to get them from a distributor. We'll look into PCB design itself uh, the assembly process, um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't go as you hope. So that's where the experience point comes in. So we definitely learned a lot along the way. Okay, so starting out with a the topic of how you connect components to the microcontroller. Um, in our case, we used microcontrollers. Uh, you see here a very simple device where you have a presence detector a little buzzer and a, a tail, which is a temperature sensor. These are all connected directly uh, through jumper wires to the microcontroller. So that might be the as easy as it gets. It could be useful for some circumstances, but uh, mostly not. Uh, you'll just end up in trouble. So the next step is to use a breadboard to connect things together. Uh, this is great for um, some types of workshops, some educational purposes. We have tried using that, but it turns out that uh, way too much time is spent on connecting these for the attendees. And even worse than that, if something does not work as they want it to work, it's very di difficult for them to know if it's a problem with their microcontroller or any of the connections or maybe their code. So we decided we wanted uh, to have something uh, uh, so they could skip the assembly process during the workshops. But it does have uh, its uh, use cases. It's very uh, configurable. And if you do make a mistake, uh, like you put the jumper cable wire in the wrong spot, you can always fix that mistake easily. So um, this is one device that we uh, started out with. It's a um, box with some input devices, like two push buttons there. It has an analog stick, a display in the middle, and a microphone below it. Um, I used this in presentations uh, to demo, and it was a real nightmare because this is what it looked like on the inside. Uh, you have a breadboard uh, on the a white breadboard on the left there. It was uh, very difficult if a wire came loose. Um, to even spot that it came loose and trying to get it back in was, was very difficult. So this just wouldn't work long term. So the next step is to try something called a proto board. So you have on top there a strip, something called a strip board. But the idea there is that you solder the connections together, um, which leads to a much more robust device. Um, you have more permanent connections. Uh, it can be very good if you have like one off projects so that you want to make a single one of something. Uh, you might not need to go to uh, PCB design then, but it can be laborious if you have a lot of components that you want to connect. And it can be hard to undo mistakes as well because you have lots of solder everywhere. Here is one example where we used a proto board so this was a music game that we had with touch sensors and some LEDs to signal when you're supposed to touch the sensors for different ones or eight different ones. And you also had some music playing uh, using an MP3 module. And you can see that in this case, you have some nice screw terminals that we've soldered onto the protoboard. 
Um, the motherboard itself can be connected uh, through some female pins. So in this case, we found this to be a nice, uh, a nice use case for a protoboard. But when we decided to make this uh, device for workshops, uh, we had to make about 10 of these. We found out quickly that it takes a lot of time. It takes maybe one to two hours to solder these, each one of these. And you end up with kind of some of the same uh, issues that with the, we had with the breadboard. Uh, it did work much better, but we wanted to see, can we go take this even further? So we ended up looking into this PCB thing. Can we design our own PCB, printed circuit board? Um, one advantage of being able to do that is that uh, it works well in, if you want small scale, if you only want a couple of PCBs, um, they're really cheap to order. So you can get five small PCBs for $2 if you uh, know where to get them. And it's also very easy to scale up to bigger production if you have the design uh, finished up. Um, the connections between the components are embedded onto the uh, PCB. We call them traces. Um, you are able to have much uh, denser uh, in terms of uh, components next to each other. You can use smaller components. Um, but it has a slight learning curve. Um, and the second potential issue is that you order this from a supplier, possibly a Chinese supplier. It might take you two weeks until you get the PCB in your hands. And that's when you find out you have a mistake in your design. <laughs> so you have to fix the mistake in your design and order a new one. Uh, takes two more weeks. And that's when you find the second mistake in your design. So that's something to be aware of is to give yourself enough time um, to get it right. And also, uh, if you're the thorough person, to, or if you're not the thorough person, to be a little bit thorough when you look uh, at your design before you order it. Yeah, so a PCB consists of a substrate, which is uh, plastic material, I think, uh, which gives it material strength and rigidity. And it has uh, one or more uh, conducting layers in copper. Um, and on uh, each side, you have something called a solder mask, which protects the uh, copper layer but it also uh, exposes copper where you need uh, to place your comp components. And on top of that, again, you have the silk screen, uh, screen where you can basically print labels, write uh, custom stuff, uh, anything you want really. Yeah, so you want to build yourself uh, a printed circuit board with components. You first need to figure out which components you'd like to have. Um, and then you want to figure out how to use that component. So maybe uh, testing it out on its own is a good idea. Then you move on to designing the PCB and you order and assemble it. So um, I guess you can split it into three parts. You have the manufacturers, you have the distributors and also the aggregators. Um, I interactly, I interact mostly with the distributors. So I've used LCSC, which is a Chinese distributor. I like their prices a lot. Um, if I want to get, if I have more urgent need for my components in terms of shipping, I use Arrow, but you guys are free to use whichever you want. Uh, one good thing is that they've recently become much more aware of the hobbyist uh, market segment. So uh, you're able to buy one or a few of the components. Um, and get decent uh, shipping rates and stuff like that. I would also recommend aggregators um, like Octopart and Fine Chips. What you do there is you just uh, search for the component that you want and it will give you a list of suppliers that have it available and their respective prices. So that's good to know. Okay, so here we have a, an environment sensor from Bosch called the BME280. It uh, reads the temperature and the humidity and the air pressure from the environment. Um, I found a data sheet, the data sheet for the sensor. And you will, if you look for a connection diagram or a typical application circuit, you will find a schematic of how it's supposed to be set up. 
And to the right here, you can see a sensor module. So basically someone took this uh, BME 280 and designed a, a very small circuit board for you to be able to, to uh, connect to it through uh, like a breadboard or a protoboard. So that can be handy to get a hold of. You connect to it, uh, you make sure it works uh, the way you want it to work, that you understand the device, the component properly, you know how to use it. That's a very good idea. And then a quick shout out to MicroPython since this is a Python conference. I love using MicroPython. It's Python for microcontrollers. Um, here we are using five lines of code to extract the uh, the data, the values from the sensor. Um, yeah, I can quickly note that line number two there, where you import BME, BME 280, this is the driver of the of the sensor, and it's just a Python class. So you're just importing a Python class and instantiating it using this I2C. This is a protocol. All this stuff I would just uh, recommend you look up on your own. It's actually fairly straightforward to, to learn. All right, then we move on to designing the PCB itself. Um, you need a uh, so-called EDA tool, electronic design automation tool. So if you want to go like the corporate route, they, the big companies, they spend a lot of money on licenses for these uh, tools and they're very I bet they're very good, but I haven't had the chance to use them. So I list now three uh, free variants, three tools, uh, which are all good, I think. But the one I've used the most is KiCad at the bottom. So I guess that's where my recommendation goes. Now, um, when you want to design a, a printed circuit board, there are a couple of steps that you do. The first step is that you draw a schematic, like a symbolic uh, schematic diagram of your PCB. And then for each component that you placed in your schematic, uh, you assign a footprint for that component. So basically how it will look like uh, in the physical world. Then you draw the layout of the PCB. So now you're at the stage where you draw a physical, uh, physical two-dimensional two layout. And then finally, you order the PCB and the components and you assemble and test it and hopefully everything works. Probably not though. Yeah, drawing the schematic uh, looks like this. Um, I can show you uh, quickly, uh, I think. So here I have KiCad open. I'm gonna open the schematic editor. So this contains the entirety of the um, a gaming pad that I, I showed you in a previous slide. So maybe the PCB uh, final version of this workshop controller. And in the middle here, you will see the connections to the microcontroller. And let's just quickly zoom into the BME280 here. So it looks pretty similar to the data sheet that was provided. Um, you can start by placing a symbol and you can search up BME280, it's a popular component. Uh, you have libraries of thousands of components. You add that to your diagram and then you start play, uh, placing um, connections of where it's supposed to go, these guys. So number five should go to ground. Um, here you can see number four should go to something called I2C SCK. So that, that is the clock. Um, and uh, I, this is the data uh, pin. So basically you want uh, the clock and the data pin to go to the microcontroller. So uh, you just add a label and you give that label uh, a name, I2C SCK. And then on the microcontroller, you give it the same name on pin 27, I2C SCK. So now the program will know that you're supposed to connect these things physically through a trace, the, using a trace, okay? Now that, uh, yeah, this is uh, another example uh, 
of the similarity between the data sheet and what we have in our design software. Okay. Next, we assign component footprints. So uh, footprints are like the, the landing zone of your component. So it defines, I guess, the physical layout of the connection points for your component. So um, this is what it will look like for the BME 280. I don't know how many different uh, sizes uh, this model, this uh, sensor has, but if you're looking at, for example, a capacitor or a resistor, they have multiple different sizes for the same yeah, value. So you need to uh, specify the footprint for those as well. Now, how we do that in our program is tools and assign footprints. So we are looking at U2 here. Uh, that's what we gave the label for, the, for that sensor. And we see that all of the components have, here have a footprint. And going down to U2, yeah, some Bosch footprint that is correct in this case. Yeah, and they are also downloadable uh, into your program. And you can also create custom footprints if you'd like uh, to do that or if you have to do that. Okay. Now, um, when you've done doing that, then you basically have a a set of components that you have decided on and also what the component looks like uh, and physically. Now uh, you go to a uh, layout editor and you import these components and they will all be clustered in the middle and you have to move them out to where you want them to be on your PCB. And all of the connections that you specified in your schematic diagram, um, you will have to actually draw a trace manually from, uh, from where it's supposed to be to where it's supposed to go. So let's quickly try to open that as well. We go to the PCB editor, yeah. And yeah, here you can see the entire uh, pad. You're also able to view it in a 3D viewer. So you can see it. Um, this is always a lot of fun to, to look at the 3D viewer. It helps up with the motivation a lot. <laughs> um, this touch sensor here is actually a custom footprint that we created yeah, just to show our logo and that you can touch it. So that's cool. Um, in the layout here, I'm going to zoom into the environment sensor. Uh, that's the U2 here. Um, and you can see that the ground pin, the, the pin that's supposed to go to ground has a very short trace into a so-called via. So this is a penetration into another layer of the PCB. So if we look at the ground layer here, you can see that the penetration actually touches the ground layer. Um, so this will now be connected to ground, which is nice because you don't have to move, you don't, don't have to take, make a long trace to some, to some other place. Uh, the same with the uh, power, but if we look at one of the uh, the data pin, for example, it should go to the microcontroller. Uh, that's a long way, and it's probably connected to more uh, I square C devices. Uh, what we can do is we can try to delete it, and you might see there's a indicator line that tells you you need to create a uh, a trace from this point to that point. So very helpful. Now the, the more uh, specialized corporate uh, tools, they have automatic tracing. Uh, so maybe you don't have to spend so much time on it, but we do, uh, at least I do. So what you can do also, if you decide to have multiple layers of a PCB, you can use mo two layers for the signal. So what we've done here is that we've created a via um, that goes to the other side of the PCB so that we can actually cross paths because they're not on the same layer, if that makes sense. All right. That is the last step of the design process. After you've done that, uh, you want to order your PCB. So um, these design tools, they have a way for you to generate 
so-called Gerber files. And these are like a standardized format, uh, which defines, uh, uh, I guess, good way to, uh, to, to uh, yeah, the, the production process. Uh, so it's, it's basically a, uh, something you can visualize. The Gerber files you can view uh, and see if everything makes sense or if there's something uh, wrong with the files. But you take these Gerber files and you upload them to your PCB manufacturer. I listed uh, three of them here. Um, the one I've been using the most is JLC PCB, also a Chinese uh, PCB manufacturer. And as an option, you might want to consider ordering a stencil. And I'll quickly, uh, I'll shortly tell you what a stencil is. Okay, now you have your PCB uh, in place and you might have your components that you've tested on its own and you want to assemble it all together. So you have a couple of options of doing that. So let's first look at hand soldering. Hand soldering when it comes to printed circuit boards are good for through hole components. So that are components in which it goes through a hole in the seat in the PCB. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to uh, to place surface mounted uh, components using a hand solder. Maybe some people know how to do it, but I think it would be very difficult to do. Um, so, in our case here, this is the final product. Um, you can see the environment sensor uh, to the to the left bottom left of the screen there to the, the display. And you also have some push buttons on the right. And these are through hole components. So I just simply push them through the holes because it matches with the footprint of the, of the component. And then I turn it on its other side and I solder, solder them together. And they are then connected because you have traces uh, to each point. So that's great. Uh, before we start uh, discussing the two other options, um, there's this stencil thing. So uh, when you order your PCB, you can also order a stencil, which is a like a metal sheet with holes where the solder is supposed to go on the PCB. So if you align it properly and you secure the, the printed circuit board and then you put this stencil on top, you can uh, apply solder paste. Uh, using a credit card or whatever you find find handy. We like using cards. Uh, I would recommend not over applying solder paste uh, because then these uh, small pads might actually be bridged with solder when you heat it up, and that's not good. Um, also, the solder paste tends to dry up pretty fast, so you might want to uh, refrigerate it, uh, keep it uh, cool. It will double the lifetime of the solder paste. And if it's already dry, you can you can try mixing some flux into the solder paste, which will help uh, loosening up, uh, giving it some moisture. Okay. Next up uh, in terms of assembly is the hot air gun, which can be very good for like uh, setting up one or a few um, devices. It can also be very well good for fixing small mistakes. Um, for placing and for removing small sensors, stuff like that. But it can, at least if you're not very good at it, it can be easy to overheat, maybe even damage the component. Uh, you might loosen some of nearby components because it gets too warm. Uh, so there's one thing you can do is you can put the whole PCB on top of a heating plate and heat it up because then the temperature difference will not be uh, as high. So you heat it up until a little bit below uh, melting point for the for the solder. Um, you can also use aluminum foil if you want to like really pinpoint where the hot air goes. And this is a learning process, definitely. But if you want to make it really easy for you, you apply the solder with the stencil and then you put it into this uh, re PCB reflow oven if you have one of those at home. <laughs> um, they're very nice for, for putting uh, surface mounted components together. Um, of course, it's easier if you have all of the components on one side. Uh, if not, you might have to run it again on the opposite side. And I don't know if you might actually 
lose the uh, the original components that you put in initially. But this is a really nice, if you have like small scale factory, we needed to make a couple or maybe 25 of these guys. So that helped a lot. Yeah, in terms of uh, assembly, um, you want to use flux. Um, don't be afraid of using flux. This is like a chemical reagent that uh, heats up. Uh, you can apply, it's like a paste you can apply and it heats up the solder very nicely. Uh, it makes life easier. Uh, also making life easier is, is if you use proper tools. So don't cheap out too much on the soldering iron, etc. cetera. Um, be very of, wary of very small form factors. So one of our sensors was an MPU 9250, which is like a gyro sensor um, accelerometer thingy. And we had lots of trouble uh, with that because our solder paste was dry and we had to fix more than half of them simply because the, the pads are very small and very close together. So it's easy for them to bridge. And then uh, finally, a uh, very good idea to write test firmware because it's not like it's not like code. You have physical stuff that can, you can have issues with connections. There's a lot of things that can be wrong. So it's a good idea to just have one script that tests all the components after you've placed it. So you can do like a little assembly line there. Um, yeah, uh, joining your local makerspace will save you a lot of money. <laughs> you don't have to buy all this equipment yourself. There's a lot of uh, skilled people there that might be uh, willing to help you. When it comes to soldering also, there's so many small things that you can do to improve drastically uh, how you do it. So just hanging out with people who know what they're doing has helped tremendously for me. Um, in our hackerspace, we also have an ultrasonic cleaner that you can see, which makes your PCBs look like they just came out of the factory. So it removes flux and fat uh, very nicely. Um, you might have access to a 3D printer. Uh, we used it to mount this uh, direction pad to our PCB, uh, our gaming pad. You might have access to a laser cutter that you can make to use to use to make these cute enclosures. We used it to basically um, decide what size the, our printed circuit board should be. So we just made a, a wooden uh, prototype of it just to see how it feels in the, in the hand. So all of these tools can help out in its own way. Yeah. You can organize your components when you get them from the, the distributor, they come in these strips. So you might want to get these tiny boxes. These are resistors. Uh, it will help you if you, uh, yeah, if you're doing, yeah, mounting more than one thing, then it's, it's really beneficial. It does take a lot of time to take these tiny components out of the strips. You can see the garbage bag is full. Also, if you do this, it creates a single point of failure, uh, which I had the, I guess I'm the single point of failure. Uh, I dropped it on the ground and it's not, not uh, so fun to, to, to make sure uh, we put them in the right boxes again. That was, we didn't even bother. So yeah, um, if you decided you've been able to make something cool uh, and you don't want to assemble it yourself, you, there are services that can do the PCB manufacturing. Uh, they can help you out with finding the correct components that you decided you want. They will even assemble it for you and keep inventory of your product and can even help with sales and distribution. So if you do find a really cool gadget and you want to, to really uh, commit to it, that could be uh, one fun approach, I would say. Yeah, Maker Fabs, I haven't used them myself, but I heard good things about them. Yeah. I think that's it. All the source code for the design of the pad is uh, is available uh, on GitHub, as well as the source code for all of the drivers. Um, with MicroPython, you can actually pip install stuff so directly onto the microcontroller. So if you do that with this pad, you'll get all the drivers that it has. That's a really nice little detail. And that's it. Thanks a lot.